the fact that we currently have 17 exchanges and, and Sapphire will be number 18, it definitely helps to have enough volume to go around, right? That is what's kind of paying the bills. Could we handle, you know, 50, 60 million contracts a day consistently on a dozen exchanges? Uh, we could because the exchanges can handle that capacity. I get the question a lot, like, well, why do we have 17 exchanges? Why do we have 18 exchanges? Until there's an exchange that pops up that just nobody's interested in, I think that they're still serving a purpose. These new exchanges, they, they're hungry. They come, they want order, order flow, right? They have to come up with new something new and different. If they just come and say, we're just like the other exchanges, please send us some of your order flow, it doesn't, doesn't work. What have been some of the key option trends so far in 2024? It's an interesting year because, you know, we had COVID, which was the retail, you know, boom for options trading. And then, you know, market pulled back in 2022, but the short dated options craze really started to pick up. So we saw the, the retail activity, single stock volume actually declined, uh, but the short dated, especially in index and ETF flow picked up. 2024 is actually pretty interesting. It's a little bit more of a mixed bag. Like we're seeing a little bit of growth in, in a whole bunch of different areas. There's not one single thing that I would point to and say, oh, this year is all about X. Uh, it's really about uh, continued growth in single stock and index and ETF options and things like flex and complex order book activity. It's, it's, it's actually, that's I was trying to think about that coming into the conference. Like, what would I say this year is all about? It's actually a, all about a whole bunch of different factors which are still pushing us forward. We're, we're looking at growth of about 8% this year. Are you seeing any growth from hedge funds and wealth managers? Looking at the data and kind of segment, segmenting it the best that we possibly can, uh, we're seeing uh, you know, continued strength in retail. We're also seeing a very steady uptick in, in the larger trades, you know, 100 lots, even 100 to 1,000, which I believe is going to be your professional money managers. And then there's this whole segment of what I call pro tail, which is really uh, customers who are coming in, you know, maybe through a retail platform, but they are basically, you know, making a living off of trading. You know, they've learned over the last few years uh, a lot of different trading styles and, and they're putting them to work. So, you know, that's like I said, I feel like we're seeing growth from all different sides, including the institutional side. Zero DTE remains around 50 percent of SPX trading. Is this sustainable? We put a lot of work into zero DT, especially last year when it really, you know, it, it went from, you know, virtually nothing to half of the daily volume. And interestingly, it didn't really seem to impact the longer dated volume much at all. And in, in fact, I went down to the trading floor. I talked to some of the, the guys in the crowd in SPX, right? It's still a, a pit traded product. I said, what do you think about the zero day? And, you know, one of the traders I, I used to work with is like, we can barely tell what's going on in there. We're busy with kind of our longer dated volatility surface modeling and everything else. There's a lot of misinformation and confusion about the, the short dated trading, zero DTE trading, where it, there's pockets of uh, positions and if, there's, if those are really proposing some significant risk to the market. You know, when we look at the data, we see these positions never really get very big. If you think back to the meme stock era, right, we saw tons of one-sided activity in names like GameStop or something, right? It was all call buyers, all these upside strikes, everything was one way. And the market makers, you know, they, first of all, they, you know, they get out of the way, they manage their positions. Uh, in the zero day, it's much more, you know, mixed use cases, right? You do have retail that are buying options. You also have retail that are selling, you know, uh, selling options, usually in the form of covered spreads to, to control the margin. Uh, and then we actually see institutional users coming in and using these options for delta adjustment. So the fact that you have so much two-way flow and that the positions never really get that big, the data I've looked at, the positions end up about seven or eight percent of the daily volume at a contract. So if 90,000 contracts trade, uh, it's usually the largest positions, positions I've ever seen are six or 7,000 contracts. And the truth is at that point, that risk is being managed by uh, professional you know, liquidity firms. And I don't, I don't see that turning into anything um, dangerous. What other ways are investors using options? Active and uh, option-based ETFs, right? So indirectly, you know, somebody may, may be trading a yield product and you have these whole communities of traders that that talk about these products. There's hundreds and hundreds of new ETFs that are using options, uh, whether they're you know, buffering the, the performance of something like the S&P, uh, whether they're overriding something like TLT, there is just an, an immense selection of these things. So the growth that's coming there, which are traders who might be buying these ETFs that aren't, 
they understand the, the profile and the performance of the product, or at least they certainly should, but they're not actually diving into the options directly. And so um, we see really interesting kind of, that, that's where there's a lot of innovation taking place because you, know, you and I could come up with an idea and be like, well, what if, what if this was our strategy? And then you outline it and you, you, know, you make it a, a disciplined approach and then you turn it into a product and, you know, and if it resonates with an investor base, then you know, it, it really picks up steam. In what ways are traders utilizing SIBO's tools or platforms to manage risk? On the data and access side at SIBO, we, uh, we have several platforms. We have LiveVol, we have Silex, we have FT Options, we have TradeAlert, which was the firm that I started. Um, all of these tools work together uh, to meet the needs of certain participants, right? So if somebody's paying close attention to order flow, they're using TradeAlert. If somebody's routing orders in, they're using Silex. Um, in addition to that, we have a whole data set, uh, a whole bunch of data sets at datashop.sibo.com, uh, where we sell things like the open close data, which actually is used to, to give a, a, a great amount of transparency into, especially into the zero DTESPX activity. So, you know, cu seeing customers kind of put these platforms to work and then knowing how much work we put into uh, evolving them and, and really innovating to make them, you know, the best that they possibly can be uh, is, a, is a great boost to the, you know, to our clients. Are there other developments in market structure, products, or technology you are excited about? There's two things this year that, that I think are really exciting. One is the evolution of flex options, right? These have been around for you know, 30 years. Uh, they used to kind of trade on appointment and nobody even paid much attention to them. So nowadays, the flex activity, which is you just get to, def you know, the customer gets to say, this is the expiration date I want. This is the strike I want. I want American style or European style. And there's even a couple of exotic styles you can do for the index option world. That volume is now 1.5% of the daily option volume. So we're seeing about 600,000 contracts a day in flex. They're also trading more electronically. And then you know, at SIBO, we're actually doing some work to add analytics to the flexes. So basically, when a flex prints, make it clear what's going on. Uh, add the analytics for context. What was the theoretical value? What was the Greek? What's the, you know, the, what's the moneyness? Is it opening or closing? All that kind of stuff makes these things much more uh, easy to deal with. The other thing that I'm very excited about is in the, in the complex order world, right? These are vertical spreads and butterflies and um, combos and revcons, all these things that trade makes up about a third of the market activity is, is in the form of complex orders. Uh, one thing SIBO is working on specifically is this, the concept of a quoted spread book, meaning actually lighting up bid offers for complex orders in real time. So rather than the way it works now is either you use the quotes and you try to make sense of it, and, but then you're dealing with bid offer and you're using midpoints, but that's really not always perfect. Uh, or you call a broker and the broker goes into a crowd and says, hey, what's the, you know, the June 6, you know, 600 point box price at? So SIBO is actually going to, and this should happen this summer, um, permit quoting of uh, complex orders. So, in, and we're starting out with SPX boxes because that's a, a nice stable uh, order type that's, that has regular activity. So you'll be able to look at the screen and say, wow, I can see where the June box is quoted. I can see where the September box is quoted. I can see where the December box is quoted and build a comfort level with you know, the ability to trade those, to get in and also to get out without having to worry about like, oh, the market, you know, the, the screen quotes are very wide in these deep in the money options, which is something that happens naturally. When you're looking at a, a structure like a box or a, or a butterfly or anything else, the, the bid offer width, it doesn't translate. So um, that's something that, you know, there's a lot of uh, way that that can go to make this whole segment of the market, which is, like I said, about a third of the activity, much easier to trade. In a way, it could be kind of used to, to mitigate some of the strike uh, you know, some of the contract proliferation issues that we have. Because really, if you just want to trade a spread, maybe you don't need the individual legs to look at. You just want to trade the spread. How has the reorganization affected SIBO? You know, SIBO definitely has been on, you know, it has had a bunch of acquisitions over the last few years. And, you know, the, the latest thing was that SIBO Digital uh, is being kind of folded under uh, derivatives in general. SIBO has an amazing group of pieces and, and the efforts to get these things to work more synergistically and more seamlessly is going to pay off. And so, you know, I love to see the fact that, you know, SIBO Labs is now under, you know, Catherine Clay, who leads our global derivatives business. And SIBO Labs puts out amazing things. They come up with these great ideas. We've got super duper quants in that team um, to be able to take an idea and say, OK, how would this translate exactly into a traded product? and pull in the product people and pull in the people with a lot of trading and a lot of market experience uh, is how we really can kind of get some new things 
uh, you know, from the drawing board really onto the, you know, onto the platform or onto the trading pits. And I think that I think, you know, as we're, you know, we have a we have a global business now, we have exchanges in Europe and in Asia, make, you know, getting these things all to work well together and also address, you know, the fact that these aren't separate lines of businesses. You, you want to be able to kind of present it as like a really a, a cohesive suite of offerings. And, you know, that's what I see happening, which I think is very exciting. How will a new trading floor in Florida change how the industry trades? I mean, I've been in the business for, you know, over 30 years now. Uh, you know, there were four trading floors, then there were five because Box opened up a trading floor. And when I remember when Box announced it at an OIC conference and I talked to them, I said, really, you're going to open up a floor? You were one of the, you know, they were the second purely electronic exchange after the ISE. And they said, listen, there are certain types of trades and participants who prefer that uh, hand-holding experience, you know, or who, who need the kind of the interactive negotiation that you get with a, a crowd. And also there's some accountability there, right? Like, you know, you know, you were on the floor, you know what it's like to go to a broker that you trust and say, this is what I'm looking to do and have a dialogue, get a price, go back to your customer, you know, and, and in, you know, SPX still, you know, trades, you know, um, most of the volume trades in SPX elect, um, on the, in the crowd. Zero day is mostly electronic. Uh, in the non-zero day, it's still mostly pit traded. And there's a reason for that. There's, there, there's a comfort level that comes if you're doing a very large trade or a very complicated trade uh, by having a, a person on the other end of the line. Our former CEO used to say, listen, once everything could be done electronically, maybe the floor will go away. But I don't think you're ever going to get the trust level electronically on some of these you know, massive trades. So the fact that, you know, that, that uh, my ax group is going to open up a floor in Florida, it doesn't surprise me because the box floor actually, uh, I looked at their data, they were doing uh, at one point about half of their total volume was trading on their trading floor. Not half of the orders. It was a much smaller set of the orders, but the order size on a, in a pit traded, you know, open outcry trade is huge. So um, there's a need for that, and, or there's a value that's added by that. And so, um, yeah, I mean, so Myax in Florida, Sapphire Floor, I think you're gonna call it, is gonna be the sixth trading floor. Uh, and, you know, I mean, this business continues to grow. We're gonna, we're gonna trade about 12 billion contracts this year. I think we're gonna beat that. There's a lot of opportunity out there, right? Even for small innovations, when the numbers are so big, uh, it's one of the reasons we continue to see exchanges kind of popping up because even if you only get a couple percent market share of 12 billion contracts, it's actually a pretty big number.